This is Let's Talk. Let's Talk Radical Radio, getting to the root causes of the important issues of the day. This on-the-air community forum believes your voice matters and welcomes all thoughts and views without judgment. Please join today's conversation by calling 415-663-8492 or tweet us at Let's Talk on KWMR. Okay, your hosts today are Paul Raphael leading our conversation, Robin Carpenter answering the phones, and I'm Mary Frank. Bernie Stephan is away today. Yes. Um, When you call in and hear the phone ringing, uh, hang on. When you hear Robin say you're on the air, please give us your first name, turn down your radio, and watch your language, which should be... English, because <laughs> we're English. Um, so today we're talking about hypocrisy. Asking how and why. <laughs> oh dear, a typo. Why do we expect <laughs> hypocrisy from some people and not others? Among other questions, we'd love for you to join our conversation by calling us on four one five six six three eight four nine two. So the political season. The presidential primaries uh, really brought home the, uh, the the specter of hypocrisy, right? I mean, the, and it occurred to me that we expect politicians to be hypocrites, be hypocritical, to expound on something and yet be to to take a position on something and tell everyone what they're their greater goals are for their when they become president, and yet you know that that's not going to be the case. So they they have this public persona that will get them that will get them elected, and you know that half of what they're saying, maybe or more, is uh, actually they're not actually going to do anything about it. And it, it occurred to me that there are there are sections of society of uh, professions and uh, and business and that we expect them not to tell the truth and I'm calling it hypocrisy although you know we can discuss the difference between lying and hypocrisy hypocrisy is lying with a cause in mind with a goal in mind uh, with a to create a public persona that everyone will think you're one way when in fact you're doing something else like uh, I don't know my favorite example of course is the uh, the family values Christian right wing <laughs> <laughs> Republican senators who are found with their pants down in a public restroom uh, who are also uh, against any kind of sex education and against any help for women and uh, and espousing family values at all times, and that uh, uh, trans transgender people are the ones that are dangerous in bathrooms. Whereas, you know, mm. statistics show it's Republican <laughs> so, uh, senators. Republican are senators that you need to keep away from your little boys, <laughs> and they can be in the same bathroom. Um, I think that you know it's an interesting thing. I think you tend to find hypocrisy in places where people are so strident about their viewpoint and how right it is or very Mm. extremely dogmatic. Um, That's where you do, it seems to me, I I almost wonder if people who have hidden dark secrets, uh, you know, gravitate towards putting on a persona that's so the opposite of their inner dark secret. And maybe that's why we get so frequently these scandals out of these, you know, churches that are extremely uh, dogmatic and rigid. Uh, And if that... You know, so so I guess you can say in some ways hypocrisy is driven by the need to hide a darkness within mm-hmm. us. And I would add to that uh, repression, that repression 
uh, instigates and encourages these kind of behaviors because there's no outlet or no um, opportunity to discuss or get educated on these subjects or on self-awareness or on sex education. Uh, repression can uh, bring about these in a way that almost nothing else can because there's no place else for it to go except to a lie. And especially if you've grown up in a very rigid church background and you're realizing growing up that you're gay or that you're transgender or that you feel like a liberal, you know, that there's there's no in in that environment. It is imperative for you to stay within your own tribal fold that you lie to yourself and others about who you are. So what a horrible internal pain that has to be, too. Yeah, and you see that in business, too. There's In the corporate culture, that was my experience, that there it's a culture that promotes lying. Because you can't take responsibility. If it's some place, if you goof, you can't say it's you. It's got to be somebody else. Mm. Uh, it, it incorporates, uh, it encourages is the word I need. Uh, it encourages those kind of behaviors. And mm. it's a very toxic environment. And the question I think also related to that is how do you change that? Yeah. And, and what happens when you're in it? I mean, Mary and I know both having been in uh, uh, media, marketing, and sales, we used to corporate call corporate television. Corporate television, and I was in corporate radio, and we used to call our once a week. We had to fill out a form showing all the different sales calls we made. Now it didn't matter that your budget was a hundred thousand for the month, and you'd already billed one hundred and fifty. You had to show that you had made fifteen sales calls a week, which was sort of impossible. And so we used to call that Creative Writing Friday, because we would, you know, we all knew that we had to make up those fifteen calls, or we got in trouble, even if we had far exceeded our goals for our budgets, it didn't matter. You had to show you did 15 calls. And it was one of those things that we just, you know, and I'm not normally a person who's comfortable telling uh, something that's untrue, but we had to do that if we wanted to keep our place on the team. Mm. So that's how, that's part, one of the questions that I had was that uh, when it's, when hypocrisy and lying is such an integral part of your working life and uh, and your TV watching life. And, and, and sometimes your personal life. What does it do to your that. personal life? Yeah, well, it's where do you draw the line? You know, do you, are you lying to your partner? Yes, yeah, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yes. You have to lie to your partner. Am I fat? No, you look fabulous in that. Unless you're uh, married to Andy. Andy will go like, yes, honey, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I know. So how does that affect us? And where do you draw the line? And where is... Uh, does the suspicion of everyone uh, cloud your your relationships with people that you meet? That's... Uh, and I... You know when the when all the the scandals erupt and the uh, and the and the people that we sort of respect and people who are maybe going to be running our lives from uh, from D.C. for the next four years when they're caught in lies, it's just another brick in that wall that they're building that that keeps us away from the process it's like well why would i get involved in this process if they're all a bunch of hypocrites why would yeah. i why would i want any of these people in there uh and that's part of the right the the uh, bernie sanders was was i'm saying was already uh was the guy who supposedly was coming had out had and never saying been his alive. truth yeah and was not as much of a hypocrite, maybe, as uh, a lot of politicians in D.C. Uh, Trump supporters all say, oh, you're telling the lack of eels. And, you know, I but mean, that's saying that he's telling the truth. And that's what people are looking for. People are so hungry for the truth. And they're willing to go to Trump. To <laughs> and, and, I mean, that's the appeal of both Trump and Sanders, is right. that <clears throat> if you were a, a person who was normally a liar, you wouldn't say some of the offensive things that Trump says. So, in a way, the more offensive... He he is. The more he upsets people, the more it reinforces this guy's not a real politician because a real politician wouldn't do something that stupid or wouldn't wouldn't offend a certain group of people. So in a way, I mean, I was listening to the pundits last night. Um, I should call them pund idiots. But anyway, and, and they're, they're totally missing when they talk about, well, Trump has got to, like, you know, kiss it with the, the RNC. And I'm thinking Trump doesn't have to do anything. It's your constituency that voted him in. It's your constituency. Constituency that's saying we're so tired of lies, we're so tired of lies that we're willing to have somebody 
who doesn't have a filter between right. his brain and what he says because we're so starved for hunger. We're so hungry for truth yeah. that we're willing to take that because that shows to us that he's honest. You and know, I think that this traces back to um, a f- oh, maybe it's always been like that. I'm not sure. But the underlying atmosphere of competition in our culture where you see it on everywhere. Uh, being the best and beating the other guy, and mm. it isn't just in sports; it's it's everywhere, and that underpinning of competition instead of cooperation encourages these behaviors. When you don't have that sense of commu- true community, when you don't, mm. things don't ever feel safe, and when things don't feel safe, people you fall go, into these behaviors because mm. it's underlying it's, and it's fear as well. Yeah. I think it's fear and, as well. And, and, I think all of us in our deepest place, if, if, it, if it means telling a lie to survive, I'm not going to say I wouldn't do it. No. You know? And, well, you know, it's interesting, Mary, because the one place where uh, talking about our culture is so competitive and it's not okay to ever lose. It's not okay to lose. It's not okay to fail and come back from it. And that's the one thing that Donald Trump does tell uh, or spins his own successes that he's one of the things that really upsets him is when he's being told he's a loser or he lost or he wasn't successful that you can see the very competitive environment he grow, grew up in mm. and that that's the one place where he has spun things everything from Trump University I'll teach all of you how to be billionaires and those right. kinds of things so it's interesting the place where he does seem to spin the truth is the place where he can't stand to be thought of as a failure. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and he, he can the never whole def- apologize. He can, mm-hmm. it's, he's the classic uh, male mask, alpha mask male, mm-hmm. who can never apologize, now, never admit he's Clinton? wrong. Clinton never yeah. apologizes. She's like, oh, well, I, you know, I, it was okay for me to do that. You know, she has to be totally back. She and Trump both do that same thing. Mm-hmm. They don't understand how much the public's hungry for, like, that was the stupidest email thing ever, and right. I just figured I could do it better than they could do it, and I'm so sorry. It, 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 yeah. People really resonate with an I'm so sorry, that was really wrong, here's why I did it, and I won't do it again. Well, why do you think the hypocrisy is, is also rampant or in some personal relationships? What is that about? Is that about not feeling up to snuff? Yeah, and I, I, I suppose I, uh, it's, I think it's it's engendered by this whole systematic uh, institutional hypocrisy that we that we all see happening and that we feel helpless against. And uh, as you were saying, in your in your jobs, you had to you had to lie to keep your job because management upstairs decided that mm-hmm. this and this and this was going to prove that you were doing your work. Uh, similar thing in schooling, you know, with the test. Yeah. We're not really educating. We're teaching them how to take right. tests. Okay. This is Let's Talk Radio with host Paul Raffel, Robin Carpenter, and I'm Mary Frank. Please call us at 415-663-8492 and tell us how you think hypocrisy affects your expectations. You can also tweet us at Let's Talk on KWMR with your thoughts and opinions. We also want to let you know that Shoreline Highway is blocked in both directions between Stinson and Bolinas due to an overturned dump truck. There's also a car off the road on Sir Francis Drake about three quarters of a mile east of Sir and Stark. So let's get back to hypocrisy. Uh, Yeah, so hypocrisy in relationships. Um, I, I think it's I think it's engendered again by this whole atmosphere of hypocrisy that in work in in politics in uh, what you're watching on TV. I mean the the scoundrel is always the hero, right? I mean you always like to see a good scoundrel, someone who's uh, who's in there, you know, someone I... dissembling, you know, Richard the Third character. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's true. It's yeah, true. It's uh, everywhere. They're interesting to us, and that's. Uh, it, uh, I think it's, yeah, it's create. I don't know about, you know, I wouldn't know about hypocrisy in relationships <laughs> myself. Uh, because, of course, I am the perfect partner. There, I just set myself up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was thinking last night about the show and, like, what about, you know, personal hypocrisy? Hmm. And to me, uh, it's very linked to betrayal. 
in, in a close and loving relationship, you know, it doesn't feel, um, it's just not honest. You, you know, mean hypocrisy it, creating betrayal. Yes, and yeah. so it's, it's as a form of betrayal because a good sure. relationship, you're supposedly you're going to be talking about stuff. You're going to be basically And you're going to be honest with each other. And I was thinking, okay, well, where do I draw the line? Mm-hmm. And I looked at my life, and there have been maybe several times where this has come up, and in most cases... That was the end of the relationship. It was a big enough issue, and I felt like, oh, my God, I'm just, you know, I'm stepping away from this. But there were also a couple of times where there was a, a lovely history with this person. We loved each other very much. It could it be a friend or a partner? And uh, can we work through it? But And in one case, I could, and in one case, I couldn't. Mm. Mm. But um, I think you kind of have to draw a line. Uh, sure. At least I do. Because at a certain point, hypocrisy leads to betrayal, sure. which makes it impossible to trust that person. And you can't really build a relationship mm-hmm. without trust. The, uh, the Greek root of the word hypocrite is, uh, is performer, actor. Ah. Uh, and uh, we got a, I got an email from Charles. Charles Schultz, uh, he says it's about how modern media makes us all into performers. So... We have this example, again, we go back to Trump, who's a performer, and he's made his, made his mark in uh, TV. That's how he became so popular, was his so-called reality shows, which is hypocrisy in itself. Right? But anyway, uh, and that people are willing to do anything to play the part that they want others to see them in. Right. I mean, we 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 create our public personas, and hey, if you have to if you have to be hypocritical to have that persona, that is being. I think that's more common now. I think it's uh, it's more accepted now than perhaps it used to be. I'm not sure. Maybe, I think maybe I think it was Facebook. Acceptable before. I mean, Facebook has created this environment that we never had before which puts all of us up on the stage. Mm -hmm. And Instagram. Uh, And Instagram. And so in Facebook and Instagram, am I going to post like, oh, my God, I've got this rash under my arms today. And, 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 you know, and my husband and I had a fight last night. You know, no, it's like, here's a shot of like, look at my garden today. You know, is that hypocrisy? (laughs) Because no one's, I mean, I've had in the past year and a half, two different people I know commit suicide. Mm. And Going back, and I just, on both of them, went back and looked at their Facebook post, and I didn't see anything indicating that was going on with them, you know? And so I think there is this pressure. I mean, I've thought about, um, I have a friend of mine who just went through a really horrible breakup with a guy who was like a classic abusive partner and you know and now she wants to like write all about it on facebook and then my first response to her was like wait 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 don't do it yet don't do you just, just wait until you've calmed down and you're not so angry and then i thought why should i tell her to wait why shouldn't facebook be you know how i've posted all these things well the real reason i got divorced is this mm-hmm. jerk but you know mm-hmm. why you know my first thing was to protect her from looking bad from looking like a vengeful person mm-hmm. or doing something she might regret and i thought why shouldn't we on Facebook be whatever we are in the moment, you know? But I, I found myself immediately, like I was her PR person, like don't put that up there. But for her, that was going to be or is really important for her healing relationship, whether I like it or others like it or not. So she really wants her persona to be, this is what happened to me. And you know? I, I, I understand that. I'm sympathetic with that, but I don't completely agree because I have a different issues with Facebook and Instagram. I think that there's certain things that don't necessarily, uh, aren't necessarily appropriate to go out to the world, maybe to your inner circle of friends, or uh, I just feel that the whole concept of privacy and the sacredness of privacy uh, is completely violated in those cultures. And there's some, you know, I don't care if they have a rash under their arm. Maybe their mother cares, you know, it's like, do we really need to know about the pimples on the behind? You know, it's like right. it's enough already. <laughs> well, it's, so, you know. yeah, so privacy and uh, privacy, yeah, and and just being in community, just being in the world, being friends with other people, uh, lying as such, maybe not hypocrisy, but little white lies that we tell all the time or hiding behind 
like you say, uh, posting the pretty pictures of the garden, even though you're I'm having a bad day, having or a, whatever, even though you're depressed or, or whatever, and, you yeah. know, thinking of terrible thoughts about somebody else. But you don't want to put that out in public. I think that's uh, that's a, a sort of a normal reaction. Uh, to being in a culture, to being in a society where you have neighbors and friends and, okay, you feel kind of peevish today and you want to post something peevish on yeah. Facebook for the world to see. And uh, and it'll always be there. And maybe, is that hypocrisy? I don't know. I think that's well, it, it's, it is maybe there's an element of I think hypocrisy it's discern- in, I don't think, no, I don't society. think it's, that's not hypocrisy. But, but that's, I, that's discernment. But I also think mm. it's what Paul was talking about being a performer. All of us performing, especially, mm. I feel, women, we have to, we're supposed to look well-groomed, put together. We're supposed to be lovely and calm. I mean, one of the biggest things against Hillary Clinton has been that she comes off as strident and harsh and angry, you know, and so, you know, as a woman, I'm particularly sensitive to um, we're, you know, there is a certain persona that that we've always been told to have to be nice, to be lovely, to be gracious, to be, you know, so it is interesting as Facebook is this uh, platform and Instagram as well, where you're asked to perform, you're actually performing, you're, you're putting forth words images mm. and we didn't have that before we had some of us would that always like to storytell and perform or whatever by personality but otherwise we didn't really i mean maybe no but we were doing it in the backyard with our neighbors or, or maybe you we know? were doing it with showing our home movies yeah. or our vacation yeah. movies or things like that but it it's creating this sort of electronic broadcast persona is an interesting new world and it does really bring up you know, I have friends of mine, um, especially uh, two or three of them who are beautiful writers, but also suffer from bipolar disorder. And so they're pretty open about posting when they're going through a hard time. And, and you know, I had a really bad night last night. And then they're fa- to, to them, they really rely on the back and forth with their Facebook friends. Like, hey, you, want, you know, want me to come over or, you know, why don't you come join us over here? You know, that it's there. And now both of them only they don't post public. They only post to friends. Mm-hmm. And because you can have privacy, just friends or friends and friends of friends or I do mine public because my husband, who used to specialize in in, uh, online and Internet security, said, you know, nothing's really private anymore. (laughs) So do it at public and know that it's public. And that will be enough of a governor on you, as Mary, you said, to discern what to Mm -hmm. put out there. Well, so and you're talking about talking over the back fence with your neighbor in the old days. That was Facebook then. That's when you're face-to-face with your next-door neighbor who maybe you don't particularly get along with. Mm-hmm. All right? But you put on this face of uh, civility. Ah, oh, that's the word, civility. Mm-hmm. Um, there are people in every community, I won't say this community, but <laughs> there are people in every community that uh, you might not get along with, but you're usually polite to them in the store. You don't go at them and <laughs> tear them <laughs> limb from limb, even though that's kind of what you wish you could do in, in your in your mind. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's hypocrisy, though. That's no, just see, that's good going, manners. getting along and yeah, good manners. It's good manners, right. and manners are good. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. It helps keep a community together. So what, then, is is the bad hypocrisy. The bad hypocrisy is when you're pretending to be something that of a... Not. of Well, but with that just that being nice to people that you don't like is also sort of a hypocritical thing because you're prending, pretending to be sort of a friend of theirs or maybe it's just an acquaintance. But uh, So where is that line? Where is the line between think, little white lies that you or little bits of getting along? I think the line is... And oh, this sorry. whole hypocritical, you know, I am better than you and you should do this and this and this because that's what I do. And right? no, to, to me, the line is, does it have a really destructive effect mm-hmm. by not being truly genuine? And you see that a lot, you know. I, I think... To me, anyway, that's where I draw the line. You can overlook a lot of blah, blah, blahs. Unless it hurts somebody or if it hurts especially children, um, you know, that's, uh, I, I think that's behavior that needs to be changed or abandoned. 
So it's interesting because I think you always, I mean, I've never been in a community where there isn't the person or so that seems like the nicest, friendliest, most wonderful person. But then you find out that they're really doing a lot of dirty deeds. You're talking and, about me? <laughs> <laughs> no one in this room. No one in this room. But, you know, we, we, it is, that is a, is a sort of an iconic, um, person or stereotype of the person that's so sweet, so sweet, 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 but actually does some pretty mean, cruel things Mm. and has a mean streak. So that kind of thing, I remember one of my pieces of my mama's advice, when you start a new job, the person that comes up to you and is all friendly and nice, hey, welcome, welcome, you know, here, here, come on, let's go have coffee, blah, blah, blah. And it's all like up in your face, sweet and nice. She said, that's the person that's going to stab you in the back. <laughs> and wow. do not become, Woo! and be be slow and cautious in who you Whoa. befriend at work because in a new job, you're frequently vulnerable and a little scared. And the person that's all like, hey, how are you? Oh, let's go have coffee. They're just trying to find out the dirt on you and they're going to mm. stab you in the back. There. And you know, I have to tell you, Ninety percent of the time in my life, that person always shows up wherever I am in some capacity in a, in a new situation, and they are really the person that that sort of um, makes you know information is their power and gossip is their power, and they're trying to find out who you are, what are your weaknesses, those kinds of things. So I always thought that was interesting because that was her teaching me. Here's a classic hypocrite, the person that's all friendly and nice, but what they're really trying to do is find out as much dirt on you as they can. Hmm. And then they, they, they can bank that. And that's probably how they hold their power at work. They know all the dirt on everybody. I'd never thought of that before. (laughs) But uh, so it's like the, uh, the, everyone was telling me the, uh, the casserole ladies. If you move into a new town, the casserole casserole ladies ladies come. Should well, we be wary sub- of them, or is that something no, well, just only, being neighborly? You only need to be wary if your mom just died, and you don't want your dad to immediately be scooped up by somebody at church. So the casserole ladies will start coming in and trying to grab your dad. But otherwise, in the Deep South, for anything, birth, death, illness, you make a casserole and you take it over. Or you make it and freeze it and take it over. So we always take casseroles. So, But, but hypocrites and or predators trying to steal your daddy will hide behind a good casserole. But, it, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to tell a sweet story about that. When I moved in um, to the valley uh, from a city, uh, I think the second day, this is the other side of that, um, I came home from work, and there was this beautiful basket of fruit that had obviously come off of somebody's trees and garden with a welcome to the neighborhood. Now, come on, you guys. Oh, no, that's sweet. That that's, was so that's, that's sweet. Lovely. I said, oh, yeah. my God, I'm really in a community. And it's proven she she is a, still a very lovely, nice lady. So there's there's, there's, there's that side, too. No, and I mean, that that's part of I mean, in the Deep South, there's a lot of, I think, hypocrisy people would think because we have we're so over mannered in certain ways of things to do and that those are some of the lovely traditions i love from where i came from of you know a a welcome basket uh dropping by to see people Mm -hmm. if someone's sick you know going by the hospital and dropping stuff off all those little things like that that i didn't see as much when i moved out here but before we do anything else. I would have brought you a casserole. You would have brought me a casserole? <laughs> You're a good cook, too. Hey, I want to let you guys know, this is KWMR Community Radio for West Marin, 90.5 in Point Ray Station, 89.9 in Bolinas, 92.3 in the San Geronimo Valley, and we're streaming live on kwmr.org. And we'd like to thank some of our underwriters. KWMR is supported by Building Supply Center in downtown Point Reyes Station, serving the local community's building and hardware needs since 1964. More information by calling 415-663-1737. And we'd also like to thank Smiley's. Smiley's Schooner Saloon and Hotel in Bolinas is the oldest bar west of the Mississippi and is a proud supporter of KWMR. Established in 1851, Smiley's offers newly refurbished accommodations, libations, music, and community entertainment. Event listings, advance tickets, and hotel booking information is online at smileysaloon.com. That's S-M-I-L-E-Y-S, saloon, S-A-L-O-O-N, dot com. You're listening to Let's Talk Radio with co-host Paul Raffel, Robin Carpenter, and I'm Mary Frank. Please share your views by calling us at 415-663-8492 or tweet us at Let's Talk on KWMR. 
Today, we're asking, how does the expectation of hypocrisy in public life affect your private life? Do call in at 415-663-8492. And when you hear me say you're on the air, give us your first name, turn down your radio, and please watch your language. So we got an email from Murray Seward, of course. Wonderful Murray, our most faithful listener. Um, and always with a, with a point to make, always with a, with a question, which is wonderful. Um, he says, uh, hypocrisy is different from lying. Maybe it's a subset of lying. If, say, a minister preaches against adultery while he is at that time committing adultery, we could accuse him of apo- hypocrisy. He says one thing but does another. The element of lying is that his preaching suggests that he himself is faithful, but he might not actually say that he is faithful. So is he lying? Maybe it's just that his listeners assume he's faithful. Well, yeah. Okay, that's a good point. And when I send out uh, the the notice about this show, I gave it as an example the VW uh, Volkswagen uh, diesel engines that were actually not as compliant with EPA regs with uh, emission regulations as uh, they were supposed to be, as they were claimed to be. Uh, and Murray said, using a VW example, if they claimed that they were complying when they knew that they weren't, then they were lying. I don't think they'd be accused of hypocrisy. But I, I think that in that case, VW set themselves up and promoted themselves and their vehicles as being, you know, greener than the rest and say, look how, what a great car company we are. You must buy our cars because they're so good for the planet. And uh, it turns out that was absolutely not the case. But so I would say that was hypocritical corporate. I would say it's both because the corporate piece, because PR is where so much hypocrisy happens. So the PR and advertising was hypocritical. And then the actual listing of data that was incorrect and turning that over as the data on the emissions on the cars, that was a lie. Mm. So I think you have both happening there. To right. me, a lie is like when it, data is is you know misused or told about, whereas I think hypocrisy more is sort of a presentation or a spin on mm-hmm. things. And it, yeah, it's so it's so it's such a conscious manipulation, hmm. which puts it in the lie category for me. And then the well, then there's the great example of the tobacco companies and how uh, long they fought. Okay, that was lying because they had massive data, 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 data showing that it was cancer, cancer, cancer. So that was not. And they covered it up. It was that both the so lying and hypocrisy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, I think that's so intertwined to me when you're covering up data and actually lying about data. That's, mm. that's mm. a lie. And the mm. old camel ads or whoever it was that it was actually good for you. Well, you know, almost animals. all advertising in a way, if you think about it, almost all advertising yeah. is hypocritical because you're showing the most shiny point of view on something. Exactly. Mm. So there we are. It's a part of everyday life, even my, not on this station, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> On uh, on commercial TV and radio, that's what you're hearing all the time. You're getting this spin. Yeah, and that's what we're teaching our kids, and that's that's uh, problematic. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. Well, speaking of vehicles, I just want to remind everybody: Shoreline Highway is blocked in both directions between Stinson and Bellinas due to an overturned dump truck. So, you might want to reroute or stop off somewhere and have a cup of coffee. <laughs> and let's get back to our hypocrisy. Yeah, I don't think it's just data that, you know, the manipulation of data. I think, you know, you can lie about your feelings. That's still a lie. Yeah, that's that's, still, a, that's really know. in the personal, like, mm. I think in the p- context of personal relationships. Have you ever been in a relationship where it's sort it's of... It's not me, it's you. <laughs> or, or, it's, or the relationship... It's not you, it's me. You can feel the relationship is tanking, but mm-hmm. you, you're going to have, you know, you, you aren't in a position to just yet move out or move on. Mm-hmm. And then you're kind of avoiding, say, you know, you, you're not ready to tell the person like, uh, I'm planning on breaking up with you in three weeks. You know, you know, I think some of us have been in that position before when you're like, you know, I don't think this is working. I need to get my ducks in a row and get out of here. So you well, that. So, but then you're, you're, there's an element, if you're actually married and if you went through the marriage ceremony uh, saying that you would be with someone forever and ever no matter what happened, and then 
three years later you're deciding this isn't working, I'm out of here. There, is, uh, is the hesitation to get out of there because you don't want to be a hypocrite, that, you were, uh, that you've were that made a vow to whatever God it is? And, uh, I, I, I'm, that I'm talking in terms of, of making a plan to escape. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, you know. Well, I won't tell on myself about the butter incident. But anyway. <laughs> that's for another oh, show. We don't want to know. Maybe, Maybe that's next for next week. week. Show. <laughs> the, um, uh, and the, uh, so, yes, education. You were talk- we were started to talk about education a little bit. Uh, what we're teaching kids at uh, this whole system that's being set up now where it's where it's about achievement it's a, it's achievement based not education based so you can call yourself educated even if you're not really as long as the and that the schools are actually manipulating the scores and manipulating the tests so that the school is successful so they don't get closed down so what are we teaching our kids in those situations where uh, yeah, is, not, is it okay to to lie like that well the, we, i'll tell you because I see this so clearly in the in my other world where I work with the Marine Literacy Program. We have inmate literacy services at the jail and at San Quentin. And one of the key things that we know that we're teaching, especially at the jail, is we're teaching critical thinking skills because many of these folks have low literacy skills, but some of them, it's not that as much as they were never taught critical thinking. And when we start working with them on critical thinking, they start to realize that critical thinking is what a lack of is what in, landed them where they are. They weren't taught in school how to think things through, how to go from A to B or to ponder or to, and, and mm. that's been the shock. And you know, most of my tutors at um, the jail are, are older retired teachers. So they've been teaching and through the educational system for decades. And the thing that is the most horrifying to them is that we are not teaching critical thinking skills, which creates very damaged human beings and very people who have to then fall back on things like lies, hypocrisy, stealing, mm-hmm. a bad decision making, because they weren't taught how to think through something. And, you know, I'd like to go under the foundation of that. And I know if I think I've mentioned this on the show before, but I think it's worth a repeat. Mm-hmm. Um as a foundation upon which critical thinking rests. I love what they do at the schools in Japan. Uh, For the first several years in school, I think until they're nine or maybe eight, uh, the day starts out where the kids are in a circle, and the one kid turns to the kid on the left and embraces them and says, Hello, how are you today? I'm so glad to see you. And they go around the circle like that because the foundational thinking of education is that we are in community, yes. we have respect for each other, we are kind to each other, and that is is the best foundation upon which critical thinking can rest. Because it isn't just critical thinking, it's critical thinking with your heart in the right place. And this is what makes, uh, assuming you're not starving to death and have to steal to feed your kids, but this is what makes usually pretty healthy people. But again, when you factor in, I'm talking about San Quentin again, you know, if you factor in all of the terrible challenges that so many of the inmates go through when they're growing up, that kind of cancels that out because they're not given any opportunity. They don't have any money. They don't have any education. Mm. So, you know, it's a balance. That, uh, hmm. the, see, see that, that example, that Japanese example of telling the kids to do that is that hypocrisy it's it smacks a little to me that's a little scary to me i mean i in uh, in the uk we don't salute the flag every morning mm-hmm. in school mm-hmm. as you do here which is but that's always just, seemed weird yeah. to me but mm-hmm. uh, but i understand yeah it's a lovely thing it's a mm-hmm. wonderful thing it would be great if it was spontaneous and not institutionalized that everyone was supposed I don't know, to do i've it. taught kids that age and yeah. they are very loving they yes. don't make yeah, you know absolutely. it's like it's very you know you see the kids hugging each other all the time yes. kissing mm-hmm. each other that that's beat out of them as they get older right. yeah. and i don't i don't think at that age it's hypocritical because i feel that's a natural look at animals they're the same way we're mm-hmm. an animal you know, the the really natural state, unless you're being threatened mm. by life, limb, or the food, is to be in that kind of harmony. Mm. You know, it's interesting because um, my son, the school that he went to in the city, Presidio Hill School, um, they had a lovely tradition in the morning of each person 
saying something that they liked about the person next to them. And if they couldn't think of something, they could say, I like you, but I can't think of something just now. You know, but just to start with the positive. And um, it was also interesting that we had a little contretemps about the boys being more rambunctious than the girls. And they didn't want the kids to play tag or to do anything where anyone could get hurt. And so the parents came together, all of the parents of the kids in this particular group. I think there were 17 kids. And so we all together voted that we wanted them to be able to play tag. We wanted them to be able to fall down and scrape their knee. You know, that we... No lawsuits. (laughs) Yeah, and that we wanted them to be able to... We knew boys would roughhouse more than girls and act like children. And then if something happened, we would have them work it out and an incident happened with my son and one of his best friends where um because one thing that was a huge rule was no biting and especially because at that point in time there was still so much fear around Mm -hmm. aids and so biting was considered the thing that you could be expelled for and luis bit his friend nikki in the back Hard because it went through his shirt. You could see the teeth marks to the shirt because Nikki had come over to try to uh, grab a piece of chocolate Luis had or something. And so, and then they realized that Nikki started crying. The teacher came over and they both realized Luis had committed like one of the worst infractions ever. So, the, so Nikki immediately stopped crying and made up this story with the Luis that, uh, and that no Luis didn't bite him, that Luis was laughing and his mouth was open and Nikki accidentally fell into Luis's <laughs> mouth. Fell into his face. Fell into his face. And they both, you know, were like stuck together. It was like, it wasn't a bite. And, you know, and it was really interesting because I saw with these kids, cause I used to do once a week storytelling at the school. These kids built really good, strong bonds with each other and and that, that, you know, to where they would protect each other and have each other's back, so to speak. And I liked that aspect of it, you know, and I thought that that really, I mean, that was critical thinking skills really quick Mm -hmm. to like Mm -hmm. not have his friend go home for a week. Okay, this so, is oh, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, break time. This yeah. is KWMR's weekly Let's Talk call, call-in show with co-host Paul Raffel, Robin Carpenter, and I'm Mary Frank. To join our conversation, please call us at 415-663-8492. Please do call in, won't you? Come now, let us let us have some thoughts from you on uh, on hypocrisy in your life and how it affects your life and when others are hypocritical. There's a uh, a New York Times article by Paul Theroux about the hypocrisy of helping the poor. Every so often you hear ah. wealthy American CEOs announce in sanctimonious tones. That's a wonderful. Love that word. sign of hypocrisy, isn't it? <laughs> Sanctimonious tones, the intention to use their accumulated hundreds of millions or billions to lift people out of poverty. Sometimes they're referring to Africans, but sometimes they're referring to Americans. Here's the funny thing about that. In most cases, they've made their fortunes by impoverishing whole American communities, having outsourced their manufacturing to China or India, Vietnam or Mexico. Uh, and, they, and then he goes on to give examples, you know, the Apple... Uh, cook from Apple who was from uh, Alabama and Theroux was touring the South for about three years and he saw the state of uh, of some of the communities in Alabama where they'd been hollowed out by by outsourcing by these same companies or same CEOs uh, who are running these companies and now are trying to uh, make themselves look good. Uh, uh, Paul was it Paul Cook? I forgot his name. Mr. Cook of Apple was going to hand over his entire Tim fortune. Cook. Tim, Tim Cook, Cook. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Was pra- greatly praised by most people, but not by Theroux. It happened that at the time I was traveling up and down his home state of Alabama, all I saw were desolate towns and hollowed out economies where jobs had been lost to outsourcing and education had been defunded. By short-sighted politicians, not short-sighted, hypocritical politicians, because politicians are always going to help the children, not me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is interesting just having done a month in the Deep South, you know, and going up, especially in Louisiana, going up into more of the Cajun country north of uh, New Orleans area and seeing some of these towns like Lafayette, which is really taking a hit. Um A lot of those towns and areas, people are making their money. It's not so much outsourcing, but they're making their money off the oil rigs and the gas rigs and the oil and gas. 
and, you know, where there had been some thriving small businesses that I'd been in contact with, some of them had closed down or merged with someone else because the economy, the underpinnings in the economy are starting to fail. So it was an interesting thing because talking to them about their concerns of, well, the Republicans say they'll do this and the Democrats want to get rid of oil and gas. And I said, well, you know, you have to look at at some point in time, we're going to be moving away from fossil fuels. Sure. So who... I would be looking to who are the people that are going to help the transition? Mm -hmm. Who are the people that are going to provide funding for transitioning away? Who are going to come in and help towns transition? Because there's going to be a transition. So I would be looking at not who is going to like hang on to the bitter end. I would look at who has an idea from doing, as Sanders says, a a quick pivot away, but take care of everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, and they were talking about, we talked about Trump and he's going, I'm going to take care of the coal miners and (laughs) Hillary, I'm going to take care of the coal miners. And we're all, and, and, you know, and it's pretty clear that we've got to move away from coal or the the problems Mm. with fracking. So that's pretty hypocritical that they're all going to come and save you. You need to ask how. Well, exactly. And who do you trust? I mean, that's the, when there's this wholesale breakdown of trust in a society, when you, when you have a whole group of professionals that you just don't trust, because you know that most of the time they're just saying what you want them to say just so they can um, in the back in with the other hand or they're shaking your hand with the other hand they're taking money from special interests as they like to be called uh you know uh, and everyone knows that's going on it's just a part of politics now uh so i feel like that's a really uh destructive destructive element in society right now in this cult in this country especially uh we're waging war all over the place, and yet we're doing it for peace and democracy. We're uh, we're we're outsourcing. We're 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 spreading depleted uranium every time we shoot a bullet in another country, which is unfortunately quite often. Uh, a quote from Adlai Stevenson. I remember him. Uh, Hypocrite is the kind of politician who would have a redwood tree cut down, then mount the stump and make a speech for conversation. <laughs> conservation. Excuse me. Conservation. Oh. Um, a hypocrite is some despises those whom he deceives but has no respect for himself. He would make a dupe of himself, too, if he could. That was a social commentator, William Hazlitt, a uh, huh. British social commentator and philosopher in the early 1800s. So, really, if a hypocrite is deceiving himself, is he a hypocrite? Uh, oh, right. then I, yeah, I, that's a tough one to, to but, determine. So, you know, what about the places where we were talking about impersonal relationships, mm. about the places where... You're upset with a friend about something, but you don't really like conflict and you'd rather just have it blow over as opposed to having a conversation about it. Or, you know, even if it's a community member, how do you, is it being hypocritical when you decide, I just don't want to go there with that person. I'm just going to let it slide. Is that hypocritical not to be always honest and just say, I mean, my husband, Andy is, he is almost Asperger like in terms of he cannot not tell you the truth. If you ask him something, he is going to tell you. Mm. And um, and it's something I really love about him, but it's also something that at times is really hard. Mm. Um, and it, it's so it's the most honest relationship I've ever been in. But so when I'll say something like, oh, this and this happened, he goes, well, you need to tell them. I was like, I don't want to. You know, <laughs> he doesn't understand. He goes, like, you just have to tell them. You know, and I, I said, well, I just don't want to go there. I don't think it's going to work out. And I don't, you know, and he said, we're not giving them the opportunity you know, so how do you guys feel about that when there are times when something happens and you're like, you know, I just don't want to go there. Mm, I'm to me, again, it goes, it goes, for me personally, yeah. it again comes down to discernment. Yeah. It's like, is it is it that big a deal that it's going to really prevent me from having an honest relationship with this person? Mm-hmm. Then I think you have to bring it up. If it's like, mm, not that big a deal, what's more important, peace or hurting this person's feelings, you know, it's mm. every, every situation or the different. person has hurt your feelings, yeah. but you don't want to say, I usually want to say if someone's hurt my feelings, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, isn't that where you draw the line? If you, if you feel hurt, how can you, uh, how can you just carry on again 
with that person. Without, I think I overreacted. Without bringing that up. Yeah, yeah, and I think I probably overreacted that because I, as a young woman, I uh, stuffed it way too much. Yeah. Probably now I'm blabbing way too much, but feels better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have to draw it somewhere, yeah. right? Um, yeah. You don't want the friendship to go away, but if somebody says or does something that's hurtful to you, you need to show where your lines are. You know, it's interesting because it's, like I have with with a particular family member that's in, um, uh, she's in a new relationship, and it seems like to the rest of us, like when I was at home, like wow, we don't, it we're not, you know, with this new person, it seems like she is blocking us from her, you know, and then I think, ooh, you know, if I if one of us says something, that's such a sensitive thing. That, you know, do you say anything about like, wow, I feel like since this person's back in your life, you disappeared on all of us and we try really hard to see you. And it's just, you know, you, you know, that was interesting when I was back home, that dynamic, because I didn't even get to see that particular mm. relative that I adore. And and that, but I feel like if what if I when I was back home, I kept debating with Andy, should I just call it out? And go like, Look, will you just tell me what's going on? Mm-hmm. I, I, and in this particular you know, relative it hates conflict and hates any mm. negative energy. But I all so it's, so when someone enters a relationship like that, where you see them sort of, you know, changing the connections the person has to everyone else. I mean, do you, I always feel like that's really scary turf to go on because I have a you could alienate yes. the, the person you it's love. It's so funny because, you know, I just came back from my hometown as well and had some very interesting <laughs> conversations in this way. Uh, my cousin, oh, I better be a little bit more anonymous. <laughs> uh, there, You know, there's a second wife where there's a lot of difficulty. Yeah. And uh, tremendous difficulty. I, I won't go into the gory details, but it's put a big um, wedge in the family. And he asked me, he pulled me aside, and he asked me what I really thought. And I thought, hmm. Any question dared asked is dared answered. Yes, yeah. That was kind of my... Now, I would my, agree with that. If yeah, it's brought so up I said, person. well, I'm going to tell you how I feel with the understanding that if everything smooths out and you go forth, that I will do my best to accommodate all of this because I love you and if you love her and this is the way it is, but this is what I really think. And I said what I really thought. <laughs> Fortunately, <laughs> he was big enough and is big enough a man that he accepted it very graciously. But I also have to mention that I had that experience a couple years earlier with a different member of the family and we're still not speaking. So <laughs> it can go either way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that that's a tough one when, you know, or, hurts, right? mm-hmm. or you have, like, I have a friend that's just come out of a, what I saw. I mean, I was just biting my tongue so much at the time, a very abusive relationship, and she just didn't want to see it. And she would see it and then pull back, but then get back with them and back and forth. And it was really tough as a friend to not just at some point go like, stop it, you know. <laughs> um, you know, so those kind of places were sometimes I think you have to, bite your tongue while someone you love is, you know, you're trying to get them to see something, you know, those are kind of tough. Those are some of the tougher places to me in relationships. But I want to give you a kudo, Robin, because you actually did tell me the truth years and years and years ago about a relationship that was very unhealthy. And it was you telling me the truth that actually helped me. But but boy, you were very subtle. But I treaded very lightly until I saw there was a little crack. crack. Because I thought if I don't tread lightly, I will be run cut the, off. I'll be yeah. cut off, and I'll run the other way. Yeah, and mm-hmm. so that's the thing I found. Like, is that is that hypocritical, or is that just outsmarting the bad guy that's got a hold of your friend? Well, as <laughs> yeah. long as I, I mean, you were doing it the right way. You were doing it gently and slowly, mm-hmm. just gradually making your feelings felt. As long as, as long as you're making your feelings felt, as long as that's your authentic feelings, as they love to say around here, uh, then, uh, then uh, you know, how can that, that's not certainly not hypocritical. Just a, It's just a, another method of, mm-hmm. of retaining friendship with your friend long enough that you can point out the, uh, and that the, you can be you can be there when they finally yeah, have their breakthrough. I think it's a, it's a subtle, it's a subtle thing being in 
in friendship, in partnership, in, uh, in culture in general, in neighborliness, in community, where you have to uh, juggle stuff like that all the time. Uh, I tend to just try to be nice all the time. No, you but, don't. Uh, that, <laughs> when when the buttons teasing. get pushed. <laughs> You're very honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I'm, I will not be accused of being a hypocrite on this show anyway. Anyway, uh, Later. This, this is, has been Let's Talk. And I want to thank all our listeners. I know you're out there. Maybe you didn't want to call in, but that's fine. You can listen in. And uh, thank you for your participation just by listening in. I hope you'll tune in every Thursday at 11 because your voice really does matter. And next week we'll be discussing sex. And how, with the changing times reflected in popular culture, porn, and popular attitudes, we've yet to reach a healthy balance between responsibility and pleasure. Mm. Please join us in the discussion. KWMR does not take a stand on any of the issues discussed on Let's Talk. Opinions expressed on this program are those of the host and callers and do not necessarily reflect the views of KWMR, its board of directors, underwriters, or members. We also want to remind you Shoreline Highway is blocked in both directions between Stinson and Molinas due to an overturned dump truck. This has been Let's Talk on KWMR with your hosts Paul Raffel, Mary Frank, and I'm Robin Carpenter. Now stay tuned for Attunement with Anthony Wright coming up next.